Madam Chairman, yes, I would like to move $20,635,850, which is the school budget. I'll second. Okay, moved by Mrs. Bridal Russell, seconded by Mr. Henderson. All right, let's go into our budget pages. And I really appreciate, Mr. Lunny, the summary introduction that you included inside the front cover. Uh, for the proposed fiscal year 2017-2018 operating budget. It's very explicit on the drivers of the default budget increase and the drivers of the decrease, and you have been very specific on the school default budget, and we are very grateful. Now, I'm going to turn it over to you and talk to us. May I start by... Uh offering introduction of the staff that have joined us. Our administrative team is here. Oh, good. Superintendent and myself. You've mentioned uh, the principal of Hampton Academy, Mr. O'Connor. Lois Costa, principal of Marston School, is with us. Behind them, uh, her assistant principal, Nathan Sadler, on, on your right. Uh, our director of pupil services, Jessica Parsons, is with us. Uh, Mary Borg is our food service director. And in the back row behind them, uh, we have Anna DeWilder, who is the new assistant principal at Hampton Academy, and Tim Lannon, principal at Center School. And, and, and the wonderful For those of Mr. you that have not had the pleasure of making his acquaintance, uh, <laughs> our, uh, our returning eighth grader, facilities director, Keith Lassar. And Mary Borg. And Mary Borg, yes. I did get married, yep. Uh, <laughs> I would... Uh, the gang is all here. Okay. All here. We, 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 we took that minute because they are very much a part of the team. They are instrumental in developing this. Uh, this wouldn't happen, This the work that's done without their work, without their expertise and their support. And they wanted to be here tonight. Uh, and so uh, thanks for letting us do that because they are, they are great to work with. Great team. The secret is that I so like an audience, and I, they, they, they have to defer and let me talk, because I don't get to talk nearly enough during the course of the regular season. And we will let you talk it, as long as you want to. In your hands tonight, there are yes. a couple of documents. One that we certainly want to speak to, another that we may we may need as a, as a reference. The first actually says fiscal year 1718 warrant. Uh, the slides are included in there. Uh, there are uh, some additional documents that we'll refer to. Uh, as we march through the presentation tonight. Uh, traditionally, we come to you in December with the operating budget. We come to you in January of the first week or so with the uh, money articles, the warrant articles. The chair had asked us if we couldn't wrap it all up tonight for you, given the, the demanding uh, schedule that you have. And so we structured the presentation more like January in that the warrant is included. Uh, the board has had a chance to consider the warrant. They form formally voted on, on two articles, and the other two, I think, are a formality that they'll deal with Tuesday night at their meeting, uh, I hope. Uh, but we'll start with operating budget, which is article number two, and then we'll work our way through articles three and four, uh, and then we'll come back to article one, which would be the Hampton Academy Reconstruction Project, uh, if that works. And so the first packet walks us through that. The second one is more a resource. If there are questions when we get to talking about the Hampton Academy project, uh, but also for all of you uh, as uh, folks who will consider that uh, on, on the warrant, uh, it's a resource for you to take and use as you see fit. So, Having said that, let me. I know the superintendent has some opening comments that she wants to make. Uh, so let me. I want to get right into it. But yes. the first on your first in your packet, the first page talks about the mission statement, and that's really important. I start this off every year with that mission statement because that's what drives the work that we do every year. And I just want to highlight a couple things in that mission statement. I'm not going to read it, but I want you to be. Uh, I want you to focus on some some phrases in there. Encouraging educational environment. That's very important, and you'll see the budget is built with that in mind, that we have an environment that encourages learning. The second thing is that we recognize learning experiences as meaningful. Well, you know, what does that really mean? But what it means is we're using technology, we're using 21st century skills with the kids so that we're enhancing their learning. And, and it's meaningful to them. Uh, you'll see more and more uh, in the budget where kids are doing hands-on and they're learning in different ways. Sometimes they're learning online, sometimes they're learning, in many cases, no, the textbooks are gone 
and they're using the resources that are online. So the budget is built with that in mind. Um, core fun fundamentals, core subjects is very important. When I talk about core math, reading, social studies, and science. But we can't forget those other areas, those uh, integrated arts that are so important. And the support staff that we have that help us with all the youngsters that um, have specialized learning plans. And last but not least, thinking, problem solving, critical thinking, and communication. That's all around uh, some of the things we're doing now with STEM education. <clears throat> we now just opened up an innovation lab at, at Marston where the kids are using ro Lego robots and building and, and, and developing and analyzing and uh, planning uh, uh, projects. Uh, and, and, and last, uh, the, the communication. We were fortunate, as you know, to receive money from the franchise fees. That money has been used for us for the Shark News and the, and the, and the <clears throat> Channel 13. And that's part of this mission because communication is important. All you have to do is go to the um, Hampton Academy website, click on Shark News, and see these youngsters, these middle school kids who are very poised, who are very articulate, and it's because they've had an opportunity to, to, to have funds that have enabled them to use uh, that way of communicating. So I just, I have to highlight that because I think the mission statement for the district is what drives all of us. And of course, the next most important thing are this, um, the six goals that are, have been developed. These are the new goals. The board uh, goes through a process every year of looking at what, what's happening in the district, what are the needs, where do they want to focus, and um, every year they, they revisit these, and uh, sometimes they stay the same, sometimes they change up. But the first one is all around curriculum and assessment and instruction. You'll see that in the budget. Human capital, those are our teachers. Those are positions that we need in order to be successful with the youngsters. Communication, I alluded to the shock news, but we're using Channel 13 and our websites, and we now are tweeting, and we have a Facebook account. So all of those ways for <clears throat> us to communicate are really important, and that's why the board has, for the six years we've been here, has always had that as a goal, because we wanted to reach out to the community and our stakeholders. Uh, governance is uh, always on there also because the board has an obligation to review policies and to address issues in the community. What, what kind of issues might they do? Things like contracts, grants, starting time. They've done an analysis about when start times for when the kids come into school. So those are the kinds of big <laughs> issues. And we have funds in there so that we can do some research and design when those things come up. Uh, finance and facility, of course, we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, and, and we need the money to be able to do the work that we do. And the, probably I would say their number one priority this year has been the, uh, the successful passage of a warrant article for Hampton Academy. And I think you'll see that played in our presentation when we do on the warrant. So I don't want to, unless there's any questions, I want to go right to Nathan because he's going to jump in and he's going to start the questions on the operational budget. So everyone received the budget book. We right. had a chance to look through that function by function, uh, line by line, if you like. Certainly I'm willing as a part of this tonight, uh, this conversation tonight, to, to talk about any particular line that you might have. But uh, one, because as I've said before, Dad always told me, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Uh, and because I've learned in my, my time working in the schools that different learning styles uh, mean that different approaches uh, or call for different approaches. And so I try, to, I try to wrap this conversation of these budget numbers up in as many different ways as I can, as quickly as I can. I'm also guilty of talking quickly because of that, because I want to get through a whole lot of information. Slow me down, throw the flag if there's a question or something that doesn't make sense. But let me take you through Article 2 will be the operating budget. Uh, that language uh, is according to statute. Uh, the budget as proposed, uh, uh, Ms. Bridal already referenced $20,635,850. Start at the beginning, which is where are we today? <clears throat> at your March 16 meeting for the fiscal year that started July 1st of 16 and will end next June 30th, our operating budget is $20,423,340. You passed the long-term maintenance article of $300,000 as you have for a number of years, and there was a child benefit article for Sacred Heart of $45,600. That operating budget now includes the $239,000 that were 
approved uh, for the teacher collective bargaining agreement year one. And I've bundled that together now. It's, it becomes part of the operating budget. So total appropriations of 20768000 So that's where we start. Where we're going is that the default budget we'll walk through first and talk to you about those items that are prior year, plus or minus any contractual and legal obligations, minus any one-time appropriations, <coughs> and we'll build the default. The default is a $255,000 increase. It's a one, one and a quarter percent, and the default budget on the, on the warrant will read 20679275 Beyond the default, there are some adjustments, some, some requests being made in the proposed budget, and so the proposed ends up being $43,425,000 lower, which is a deduction from the default of 0.2%, leaving you the $20,635,000, which is a net increase of $212,000 and a 1.04% increase over the current year. Now let me walk through what I try to use, which are components, if you will, or, or um, bundles. <clears throat> First, one of the big cost drivers, obviously, is labor, and the biggest pool of labor we have are the teachers in the schools. <clears throat> this default budget includes the contractual increases for the teachers according to that collective bargaining agreement. We have actualized the budget for current employees, so you've adjusted for the hiring and the comings and the goings. We're budgeting for year two of a four-year agreement that we voted back in March of 16. And just to remind you, that agreement that we voted for offers 1.75% increase to those at the very top of the scale. It's a 12-step scale. Now let me reference your budget book. In the, under the Info tab, you, you, have, you don't have to go to it, but under the Info tab, you could see it. You could go if you like, but it, there's the teacher scale for next year, the para scale for next year, the classified support staff for next year. All of those are in there in case you want to reference back and see those. So the, if you're at the top of the scale or beyond, you are a 1.75% increase. And for those who are in the scale, they get the step increase and the scale moves underneath them by half a percent. That was what was agreed to each of four years in that collective bargaining agreement. There are no changes in the staffing proposed as a part of the default budget. By definition, it's the same as the prior year. That category calls for $94,771 of new money. So the second category then is the other labor union we have, which is the paraprofessionals, the SESPA. We're budgeting for year three of their four-year deal that was voted the prior year, March of 15. <coughs> that agreement calls for uh, salary increases of 1.75 as well, and the employees advance a step in their scale. These are the paraprofessionals. There are kindergarten aides, our special education aides working with identified students in our buildings. We're adding two para positions here. These are roughly $18,000, $19,000 a year uh, salary position, salary if you want to cut wage for a para uh, working in any one of those categories. In this case, our IEPs, our individualized education plans for our identified student population already anticipates or predicts that we'll need two additional special ed paras to meet the needs of those federally mandated IEPs to provide services as appropriate to those identified students. Total dollars new here, $48,280. Please, Brian. Um, is this kindergarten? Or what these are anywhere K-8 or preschool through 8 because these aren't the these aren't the kindergarten aides in the classroom. Right. These are a one-on-one -on -one aid moving generally during the day with a, a single student providing support. So they could be classrooms. anywhere at any school. Those two, uh, those two depends on where they assign people. Those two are are not specific to a school right now. They are specific to students, one of whom one of whom is in one school and one is in another school, right? So without being too specific about special ed kids, yeah. I get it. So yeah, right now that's a district-wide assignment. And it's really driven by by student population that we know now. Uh, today, today, as I'm putting together and making the photocopies, uh, the, the director of special service, the director of student services says, um, oh, by the way, <laughs> guess what's coming? And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a changing reality over the course of the year. But we base this on our best projections right now for what next year will look like. And it doesn't hurt to stress that you're budgeting for a year that does not begin until July 1st, 
2017. And won't end until June of 18. Yeah. Correct. And, yeah, just, a, just a quick footnote in terms of special education. Um, the district has been able to stay well under the district average for numbers of students in special education. Um, the average around in the state is about 15% of the population in, in your school district will have uh, special education needs. Now those needs vary, so it, it could be learning disabilities, it could be somebody with developmental disabilities, it could be speech and language, OT, PT. It, it just, it goes the gamut, but um, in, in Hampton we're, we're running around 12%, so we are under state average. Lots of efforts are made by our, te our classroom teachers to provide supports within the classroom before they need to go to an IEP. Um, but when a student comes to us and is new, like today, we have a new registration, or tomorrow we have a new registration, we have an obligation to provide that service with that when that youngster comes in with the IEP. And in the current school year, you are uh, working with um, English as a second language youngsters, uh, what, 30 plus of them, right. which is another challenge for the district. Right. Those youngsters aren't. Uh, <clears throat> those youngsters aren't, do not have an IEP. However, they do um, require uh, specific and ins explicit instruction um, that allows them to learn English. But because in Hampton, we immerse them right into the regular ed classrooms, so it's amazing with the support from our, we have two teachers now, um, supporting those youngsters and immersed in regular education, the progress that those youngsters are making has been phenomenal. Um, every year we have to test those youngsters and we get a report back about how they achieve and every single one of them are reaching their annual measured objectives. So we're very pleased with the progress and again, I, I emphasize this all the time, Nathan probably is tired of me hearing it, but you know, our teachers are very skilled and they're very competent and because of that, it, it alleviates some of the problems down the road. So. Sorry, Nathan, nope. I didn't mean to cut I have in. No, please, you. anytime. Jump He's in nice. This. He lets the ladies <laughs> talk once in a while. Once in a while. Okay, it's, sir. It's hard. With, it's hard to get a word in with me. Hey, <laughs> listen, New Hampshire retirement, you've probably already uh -huh. talked about in other elements of yeah. your um, yeah. Yeah. responsibility. The rates on teachers, so the contributions that we as an employer will make for our teaching staff is rising by 10.8%. Uh, the non-teaching uh, employee category is rising by 1.9 percent. The rates are the rates are included there uh, for information's sake, but the total of that category in New Hampshire retirement is rising by $180,000. It's it's our single greatest, well, one of our greatest um, uh, cost drivers in this year's budget. All of the other benefits are are increasing a total of $21,629. Health insurance is going down by three hundred uh, three thousand uh, dollars. Our guaranteed maximum rate increase. We are a member of Health Trust. We've been given a guaranteed maximum to work with for budgeting purposes. We'll find out in the spring what the rates will change to July one. We're in the July pool uh, with many of the school districts and some municipalities. Our guaranteed maximum increase one point seven percent was the lowest in the state. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to attribute that to our health and wellness initiatives and the work that's being done. We understand that, that uh, it's hard to rip out data to show that mm -hmm. and that there are lots of other data elements that go into the rate settings, uh, but, uh, but we certainly appreciate the support that the staff have afforded us in, in following these initiatives and obviously health and wellness, uh, when it's positive, drives attendance, which is better for the continuity of, uh, of instruction in the classroom. Uh, but it also pays off in your rates sometimes. And so our 1.7% increase, as we projected, was still less than what we have in the budget this year because last year we budgeted for the guaranteed maximum and the rates came in slightly lower. Mm -hmm. And so that margin that's in our financials this year that will be part of the surplus is enough to... To, to cover what the increase could be as a max next year. Just to give you a quick um, idea about how, imp how uh, impressive this was, the highest uh, increase in the state was 30%. <gasps> there were municipality districts that had an increase of 30%. And the, and and the, the average was about 16? 13%. 13%. 13% average across the state. So for us to come in at one point, whatever, seven, seven yeah. 
we just really, we really feel like the work that we've been doing around wellness and with our staff, this is focused on our staff. I mean, the kids get that too, but um, this was all around the, uh, the, our, uh, our, our employees, all of our employees. And as a result, for the last two or three years that we've been working on this, we're beginning to see some results. So hopefully we'll keep that going. That's amazingly low. Oh, yeah. I, 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 it is. I was a group insurance underwriter. <laughs> we were suspicious something was going on because they asked Nathan and I to present at a workshop in, in, at the state. And, and well, we didn't mind doing that. And we talked about Hampton and what we're doing in Hampton and Nathan's work with the Teachers Association and finding good plans and ones that were cost effective. And I was doing the work around working with Mary Borg. Mary's back there in our nutrition program and making sure we were talking about healthy, healthy ways for our teaching staff using the available resources through the health trust. And so we presented at a workshop, and then they turned around again, and they asked us to present again. I sent him. Um, but <laughs> you gave me an audience. <laughs> but it, we knew something was up. We knew. And then when we got this in the fall, what, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, we were, we were, really, <coughs> we were really blown away, quite frankly. I'll, Imagine let, I'll let the numbers play in our favor yeah. this time. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dental insurance not rising at all, staying flat. Uh, we had, we, we haven't seen an increase in dental, of its on its own merits in I think the last five years. Our dental rates did go up a small amount last year because we changed plans and for what was less than a five percent uh, growth in the in the cost, uh, we doubled the coverage. We, we had a plan that was covering $750 a year max per individual. We doubled that to $1,500. And so it's a more robust plan. It cost us very small money more. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that rate stayed flat. We appreciate that. Um, our costs did go up a little bit in dental because we have more people taking the plan now. One of the, <laughs> one of the downsides, if you will, of, of <laughs> increasing the value of the plan. So uh, $21,000 in all benefits combined outside of the retirement costs. Yeah. Another significant driver this year, given all of the conversation that we had a second ago about special education, is in special ed. Uh, the needs increase and grow. Uh, identified students uh, move in and move out of the district. Uh, and depending on, it's, that's really the hardest part of the budget in terms of projection, which is why we maintain the special ed uh, expendable trust fund. There's a little over 200,000, 210,000 or so, 15. $215,000 there held by the trustees of trust funds uh, against, the, against the fluctuations that we might see in any given fiscal year. But as we budget for next year, what we recognize is that even in the current year, our tuition costs are rising for out-of-district placements. It'll, it accounts for on that one line a $240,000 increase for next year. It is offset by some costs, though, because when students move into out-of-district placements and you start paying tuitions, you see some of your related services in the district that you were providing uh, fall away. We're also shifting. We have a new director of pupil services who's brought new eyes and, uh, and has found some great ways to hopefully uh, find greater efficiencies and, and, and do more with the taxpayer dollar here in terms of providing services. And so in the notes that are included under your info tab, there was a reference made to a BCBA, a BCBA board certified behavioral analyst, a position that we'd like to create in the district as, a, as a, an employee rather than a contracted, uh, contracted uh, uh, servant, if you will. In this case, the analysis, the dollar-wise analysis was there provided along with the conversation about the duties. We pay a, approaching $100,000 a year right now for the services of a BCBA working with our students. Most of the services though are delivered by assistants who come and the BCBA themselves you take credit for evaluations and the sign-off and the supervision, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> for the same money, we can populate internally our own BCBA who will provide lots more direct services with their certification and knowledge while also adding a couple of stipends to a couple of paraprofessionals we've talked about and creating our own assistants who can help provide additional services. <clears throat> we'll end up with way more services being provided, uh, probably better, at same or less cost. Uh, she brought it to us as a part of her budget proposal. We thought it was outstanding. It's essentially a net balance because we'll shift the same dollars out of contracts and into salary. So, But all told, with some of the net savings 
the total special ed is actually up $188,559. One quick question I had about this, and something we've been discussing in the town, is this person is going to be paid more than the other ones that have already been here. This isn't a teacher. This is a this is a brand new. A right, because I saw we took this out of the budget two years ago. Never had one. Your, right, well, it was down to a dollar. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. We. I mean, it's the uh, the the BCBA. Um, we have. The BCBA contract, meaning you know, a vendor, you know, a, a company contract, through a different two different agencies over the last four years, we have had them coming in and providing that service. They're not the easiest positions to find mm -hmm. put in a school. Uh, we have a we have we have a hope that we'll, you know, we're Hampton and uh, that's, there's a draw, <laughs> and we're hoping that that will come. But you can see that the salary range that was, we've placed on this is in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's. Uh, it certainly doesn't approach what your veteran teachers are making, uh, but uh, we think that that can draw someone in. And then we'll actually have that person and be able to save dollars as well, for instance, because they'll be able to provide services to the summer program instead of us, again, contracting further for that service. So mm -hmm. um, I, in the years that we've been here, we haven't actually had a BCBA on the, on the payroll, right. we, but we've contracted with a number of different agencies. And we were able to shift in the past, we've shifted that cost at times from the district budget to the IDEA federal, federal grant and the federal funds have federal funds have paid for that at times. Mm -hmm. And will that is there a chance we can get those anymore? In, in, in this case, we continue to we continue to receive the IDEA grant. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, we're we're budgeting right now to use the contracted dollars that were in the operating budget, but that means that that frees up the grant to pick up some of the OT and some of the PT and some of the other therapies. That we contract for and how long is this contract going to go do you know this employee will be on a year by year okay yeah thank you the incredible thing that some of us who've been here from the beginning when sau 90 came into being is the incredible amount of flexibility and reviewing every single year it's nothing is stagnating and that has impressed me tremendously there's a, a full-blown review every year. We need this position. We don't need that position. What are our needs this year? It's been uh, very inspiring to watch, and and I'm continue uh, to be impressed. It's Thank you. <clears throat> I I should also mention that if you were looking line by line through the budget, you saw a thirty-four thousand dollar line show up where there wasn't one before. The summer school program has been buried in our contracted services, our professional ah. services. Yeah. And we agreed it was time to pull that out. <clears throat> it went from 43,000, I think, down to 36 this year, um, in the budget did. But we put it on its own line so that we can monitor that uh, and, uh, and budget for it directly. So all of the other, all of the other elements of the default wrapped up in this, li this next slide, which property and liability, we have a three-year program that caps the increases. Our property and liability could increase as much as 10%. We budgeted for that increase, but I think we're going to see it come in lower. Uh, mowing, unfortunately, is a driver. Our mowing contracts, we've bid out the last three years, two of the last three years we've bid out, and the costs have simply risen. We were in the teens, and now we're up over 20000 so we've made an adjustment there because of the contract that we have in place right now for the mowing vendor to the contractor to come in and do all three, all three schools and regular upkeep out at Toll Farm at Batchelder Pond. That's $12,000 worth of increase. In the area of transportation, our first student big bus contract for home to school, transportation daily, that's rising by 3%. That's a five-year contract, and we're budgeting for year four, five, four, 19, 18, 19, year four, four. budgeting for year four. And then, again, talking about some of our out-of-district placements, we have some increases in student transportation, mm -hmm. specialized transportation to move students to those placements, $38,000. All of these increases uh, are offset in, in large part because we also have a reduction in debt service. So the Marston 1996 two-story addition, including the gymnasium out back, that bond has matured and we wrapped up our final payment in August of 16. So as we move forward to next year, the, re the principal and interest payment of $335,000 goes away. Mr. Pierce? It, it's well, that's what you've been focusing on. Mm 
It's important to note, though, when we <coughs> I, we will only briefly look at revenues, I assume, like we normally do. But one of the one of the big revenue impacts is that 30% of that principal was coming to us in state building aid. You know, we've been talking about our Hampton Academy project, and there's no new building aid right now. We're hopeful that the legislature might finally come around on that, lift the moratorium <laughs> moving forward. But but the building aid on what they call the tail has been maintained, which is they're continuing to pay, in our case, 30% of principal over the 20-year bonding of our project. Yeah. They're continuing to pay against the center school project, too, for two more years. Mm -hmm. So Good. we see the budget of 335000 go away, but there's also about $100,000 worth of revenue that won't be here next year. Good. Um, so, and then all of the other things combined add up to $6,900. Yes. Did Sonny have a question? Yeah. yeah. I noticed, so I believe, so you're going to need a new roof on the Marsh. We have, we are, we've already completed the first phase of, of probably a four-year cycle. Mm -hmm. um, that roof, they, Mr. Lassard, and in his uh, his infrared scans each year and all the patching that they've done, um, this is the original, original Marston School, the th what we call the third grade wings of that airplane, yeah. and the 75 wing heading out back. Uh, everything that's one story, and so we broke it up. The estimate initially was about eight hundred thousand, maybe seven fifty, depending on how we would bundle it together. But it's so far what we did was we tackled about two hundred and two hundred thousand dollars and did a piece of the of the of the um, one wing and the main lobby and principals area and part of the cafeteria, and then what we anticipate in this next year is moving forward and finishing the annex and the cafeteria, the kitchen. And doing the other wing, and then we'd probably need two more years to keep going. Are you considering using steel for the roof? Uh, I, you know what? I'd have to. I would say no. I don't. It's not steel. Isn't what we've put up there. Um, of the specifics of it, I'd probably defer to Mr. Lasard if you had questions about the contract. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a steel roof. It's a modified. Is it a membrane? Modified. Or, 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 modified. Or, 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 uh, Keith, well, want to dig on. me out? Talk, talk about <laughs> the roof. Come on. <laughs> I've been up on it. It's outstanding. Keith, use this microphone over here. It's probably a flat roof. Just tell us about the roof. roof. Yeah, they are flat. Membrane. Just whatever it is you're doing it's up there. Roof, yeah. It's a modified built-up roof is what we're installing. Okay. No slate. <laughs> not not no our slate. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a low pitch roof. It's actually not flat. All those yeah. roofs have a slow pitch to them. Um, pitch, okay. um, it's a modified built up. Um, it's I think it's the best of old school and new school. Um, it's a triple layered roof membrane. Then it is uh, we use heat. We use hot tar in between. It's kind of the old fashioned way of doing it. So then we're going to get a um, a solid substrate of. Um, Fibrous materials, triple layered, um, so the substrate becomes solid. Then we put a cold coat over it, and we add uh, rock, uh, river stone or wash rock on top of it. So that protects the layers underneath. Um, the stone has a lot of area if someone's going to do the, the math, so it's quicker evaporation. It also absorbs the energy from the falling snow and um, rain and hail, so you don't have a direct impact on a single <coughs> EDPM roof. Um, so we're looking at a long-range product. Uh, a lot of people think that it's expensive. You, you probably could save a little bit of money, but in the long run, you get a better roof, a more solid roof, and one that's going to last longer. I, I'm lazy. I want to do it right. I want to do it once. Um, and this is the roof we're having, and we've been very satisfied with this roof. This is the roof. When we we did the same process when we were doing center school, mm -hmm. um, all except for the '99 edition. Keith estimated lifespan of this type of roof. We're talking 45 years <coughs> versus uh, you know EDPM, which came very popular during the first energy crisis, and they're not they're not holding up. Go ahead, Keith. Um, you don't go on that roof and shovel it off, do you, in the winter? You don't have people... Good question. Ah. Good question. We've had some huge major snowstorms, or years with major snowstorms. <clears throat> we have removed snow from certain areas. Most of the time, it comes down to the superintendent and Nathan 
than all the phone calls we get about are the roofs unsafe. Okay, our roofs, even with the with our modification and modernizing them, increased insula insulation, have a snow load capacity that handles for international building code that's on the books today. There's a certain amount of deflection that's allowed to that. Shoveling the roofs. When they're necessary, we will shove the, shovel the roofs because we get high drifts or something like that. We are very cautious. We do not go down to the membrane. But we, what we do do is we maintain corridors or paths between the roof drains and to the edge of the building. So when it does melt, it has the river to go down to the roof drains in the roof and leave our site. So we're not gaining extra ice. We're trying to avoid ice. We get some ice, obviously, but um, and that drains down. So that's been our approach to handling the questions of excess of snow, snow drifts, and to protect the occupants of the building. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. These are Keith, very, thank you very, very you know, These are very serious conversations yeah. that we have, and I don't ever mean to make light, but if you have a chance later, I do have some great photographs taken of Old Man Winter up on the roof with me last winter or thank winter, winter before, you, taking core samples to measure for snow load and to make sure. And uh, he's, uh, he's a treat. He's a treat to follow out there. If I'd been in, in boots instead of my my leather uppers, I think I'd have been, <laughs> been in better shape on the ladder. But. <laughs> but Keith has made an excellent point here. Do it right so you're not having to deal with messes every couple of years. And that keep that thought in mind when we talk about the renovation project. Okay, please understand, Nathan, go for it. Please understand, too, that this is a very sensitive subject for families and parents. You know, oh, yes. They, uh, yep. they want to be assured that that building is safe when there's a snow load. We actually had Nathan and Keith up there conducting tests, taking this, taking samples of the snow, melting it down, and measuring the weight wow. so that we understood exactly how much weight was on that building so that at no time we put any of our children in jeopardy or our, or our teaching staff. So we take that. We, Nathan wasn't kidding when we took that very seriously. It's very important. But at the same time, you don't want to be up there with a snow blower. No, we're, we're, because we're, you'd yeah. be putting a roof on the place every year. Right, right. right. No, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> all right. So I summarize all of those elements that we just described. Those dollars total two hundred fifty-five thousand nine hundred thirty-five dollars. The default budget's a one and one and a quarter percent increase over the current year. I do have a question. Yes, sir. While we're on that, mm -hmm. the bonds and so forth. You said you're going to. You had one at the end of this. This year, and we have one a couple of years away. We'll make our last payment in August of 18. And how many other bonds do we have besides those? Not That's it. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, so there's the default budget. Now, the things that aren't protected by law obligation, you know, by definition, are the requests. Some mm -hmm. of them positive, some of them, you know, savings. Mm -hmm. So the first, let's talk about staffing. There is in the budget a proposed nurse assistant position. So. Currently, we have an RN, a registered nurse, that are certified by the State Department of Ed as well, a school nurse. We have a school nurse at each of our three buildings, Center, Marston, and Hampton Academy. We also have a paraprofessional position that has essentially been filled by a CNA or an LNA, mm -hmm. Certified Nursing Assistant, uh, and that para position has been in support of specific student medical needs. And it was at Marston School for a, a number of years, and now it's been at Hampton Academy. Okay. And that position will continue to serve needs of individual students where best uh, or where most appropriate in the district. But the, the medical needs of our student population continues to grow, both in the number of, of I, these are not identified, so these are not necessarily IEPs. This isn't necessarily a special ed matter. This is a medical matter. These are health issues. And, and so some of them are allergies, and there's any number of other that need monitoring, they need support, they need different levels of support or kinds of support, depending on the age of the children. Mm -hmm. And so as these, I tried not to use, the, I wanted to use the word severity, and I said it's growing in nature. Mm -hmm. But some of them are coming along, and they're just more significant. And, and it is becoming a very significant issue for RNs who already have, as school nurses, <coughs> a full plate in our buildings. And so... One of the ways that we th we want to try to address this is with 
not another RN, but in this case, a nurse assistant that we intend to staff with an LPN, a licensed practical nurse. Uh, we have done some market analysis and comparisons on what we think the <coughs> rates would be to provide an, L, uh, an LPN during the school year. Uh, and I and we can't, I, I don't think that we have an answer right now for specifically where that LPN will be assigned. Here's part of the vision. The idea is that this person might not actually work the school day. They might come in a little later because we really should have some first responder nursing support in the after school where we have an ever-growing number of students participating in academic and extracurricular after school programs. And so maybe that person's schedule can start later in the morning and run until the after school programming is done. That also means that we have an individual who's already here and available when we have an RN, we have a field trip, we have a nurse that's out sick, we have a professional opportunity for someone to get some continuing to, uh, education. One of the things we've struggled with uh, most in these years that we've been here is securing nursing substitutes. So it, it provides us a lot of, again, flexibility and opportunity to meet some growing needs. And we can do that at about $27,000. And so the school board was supportive, and we've added that to the request. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. You know, on bullying, you mentioned a good example is you're seeing a lot of bullying through tweeting from Washington. What's happening with the kids, the young kids? Because, you know, they're, they're right on the internet and they're, you know, the social networks. Are, how are you handling that? Sonny, we have um, computer education teachers, and part of the work that those teachers do with our kids is learning the appropriate protocols and etiquette of being on the online using uh, the, their various devices to communicate. I'm not going to tell you that we haven't had occasions when youngsters uh, went too far and uh, um, and and messaged somebody or tweeted somebody uh, that was inappropriate. Um, but we have a very, very uh, specific and a very strong policy on bullying. And that's not just a bullying, physical or verbal, it also includes cyberbullying. Yeah. So when our principals or our teachers uh, discover that somebody is cyberbullying, then that becomes part of the disciplinary process. Sometimes that happens at home. But often, what, if it does happen at home, it comes into the, into the building and it creates a hostile environment and the principals engage with those students and their families to correct that behavior. Um, I don't like it from adults, um, and adults are doing it, um, so we have to help train our children about the proper way to use these devices. And that's part of their, that's part of their learning. Mm -hmm. Good. <coughs> You have a question, Maurice? Yes, I'd like to add <clears throat> the, the idea that you're going to have, or hopefully having an LPN, uh, there are certain things that LPNs are not able to do, am I right? How would you, how are you going to substitute that person for an RN, or are you not going to do that? What is your plan there? So, so the school nurse must be an RN. Right. Um, statute doesn't direct that you have to have, for instance, an RN in every building all day long, every day. An LPN can do a lot more under the supervision of an RN. So okay. one of the ways that we can do this is that the LPN, just as the CNA or the LNA does today, work under the supervision of the RN in whichever building that individual is in, the LPN will work under the supervision of the RN. So the, the real exposure, quote unquote, will be if the RNs have all gone home for the day and the LPN is alone from 3 to 4 in the afternoon, mm -hmm. but the kinds of services and the kinds of coverage we're talking about providing will be things that are well coordinated with parents and they're the things that in the normal course of events today uh, first aid certified folks are responding to or 911 is called so I it's see. a better level of service but it won't expect something beyond what their certification or licensure will so support and allow okay thanks mm. good right. cool. go ahead okay. uh, um, and so what would be the liability of this person uh, you know if they're on their own in the afternoon no different. I mean, obviously, they're school employees, so they're okay. covered by the same blanket policies that cover our nurses and our administrative staff mm -hmm. and all of our faculty. Um, they really, they really will only be operating within, within the the definition or the scope of what their licensure allows. It's really, it's more of a, it's more of an active first aid 
you know, first responder right. in that regard. Obviously, anything that was beyond what the LPN should deal with, they'll call 911, and, and our emergency management, our emergency response teams here in Hampton are very responsive and very quick for the schools. So. My only other ob uh, obstacle, I thought, was um, as far as going with the sports teams or being with the teams, do you have... Um, What's the word I want to quote? Coaches or trained emergency people with the teams because I know they travel quite a bit. So our coaches are all first aid and CPR certified, trained have to be, so that okay. they can provide that kind of first response. Uh, in in many cases, the host. Here's another reality. I think another the, the host sites mm -hmm. have their own emergency mm -hmm. response, as do we. Uh, in some cases, there are trainers. Uh, uh, and other other um, health support staff who are available to act as first responders. But when a group of kids get on a bus and go, whether they're going on a field trip or they're going uh, on a, you know, to an athletic event or some other extracurricular, they are they are accompanied by somebody. In most cases, it's the coach or the advisor who is CPR and first aid certified. The nurses, the LPN. If we had this nurse assistant, when we talk about going on a field trip and needing a nurse, we're talking about something beyond that initial response like you get with first aid or CPR. It's it's specific needs, it's monitoring, it's medication, it's something that really steps beyond what the teacher or the coach wants to be doing. Is it special needs? Not necessarily learning needs uh, or disability, mm -hmm. it's medical medical needs. Right. Yeah. Okay, because I could see this as a scheduling nightmare for that one person that hey, to go on the I brought it to steps. When I brought it to the administrative team, what I said is, we ought to have two or three of these. Uh, mm -hmm. Ultimately, I, I think I would, I, I might let go of the health aid if I had once I had one in each building. But each RN could certainly benefit because of right. the, all of the paperwork and the monitoring and the yeah. moving about through the building and the yeah. touching. You know, the for, like being with the student to monitor, to record, to be there and make a an active decision supporting the child and and their wellness. I could definitely imagine having an LPN in each building, but. You only bite. You only bite so much. We try to do this, you know, logically. So right now we have the the the, the CNA, the health aid, yeah. and we'll add an LPN, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, but it would not be unreasonable to suggest that I might smile at you another year and say, I want to add another LPN. This is working yeah. really well. So. I'll make a note of that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nathan. We, as another request, we have a reduction. Uh, last year in the budget, we added uh, ninety thousand dollars for curriculum support. We have been in a curriculum review process that the superintendent uh, initiated shortly after we started here in eleven, uh, looking first at um, the core elements: math, language arts, moving now into science and social studies, mm -hmm. reviewing the curriculum in in the multiple areas uh, in the schools, and considering best practice, uh, considering standards. Uh, Etc. In support of that, the board offered some dollars to help implement some of the recommendations coming out of the curriculum review process, the curriculum review committees, etc. Uh, but we're, we've, we've moved to the end of this cycle with science. Uh, we we have that happening this year, but as we look to next year, those were dollars that the, we were proposing to take back out of the budget uh, because we've now made progress in implementing on uh, many of the elements that we've been in the curriculum review cycle uh, paying attention to. Okay. So that's a $90,000 reduction. We talked under the default budget about the teachers and the paras who have collective bargaining agreements. The remaining staff members in the building include the custodians, the secretarial staff, the technology team, your administrators, uh, and food service, I didn't note there. In your in, under your info tab, there was a colorful document that looked like this. Oh yes. If you like, it ties out to this page. So I'm just using that information. The budget anticipates or requests a two percent wage and salary increase for all of the people in that category. Uh, and and again, it notes it notes them there in the budget book detail. You can see the individual positions. I summarized it there so that you'd see it in in on one page. Uh, additionally, all other wage changes. We have a change in tutors, substitutes, after school programming, summer technician we added back in, and we reduced an HR assistant position. So when we came to you, I guess it was a year ago, 
uh, we asked for an HR position, a part-time position in the superintendent's office, and and I won't I won't restate all the reasons why we thought we would do that, but we we effected an initial hire, and that person lasted about six months, and uh, and I and I guess there inherent in that reality that they lasted about six months was that it didn't work uh, and the individual left and we have not filled the, the position since um, but I think we found that it, it didn't serve the needs the way that we had intended we could not find in the marketplace somebody part-time with the skill set and the and the fit uh, and so uh, in the conversation with the board it was decided that for now especially given the desire to keep the budget as low as we can recognizing some of the default increases we couldn't mm -hmm. control uh, or avoid and wanting very much to make all room for Hampton Academy etc we are taking that out so the net decrease there is twenty three thousand okay. dollars all other benefit areas because of the salary reductions fall by thirteen thousand dollars and then the miscellaneous category adds up to 17,000, including uh, some additional software and online services. So many things that we do in the classroom, of course we've gone to a one-to-one -one initiative now with the Chromebooks, but we're finding that now we want to use this tool, and we want to use this tool, and those all require some online licensing. Supplies and equipment rising by just under $10,000. In the area of legal fees and dues, uh, we've been made a reduction of a little over $5,000. Another $2,100 wraps up that $17,000, and when you add those all up and summarize, you have a $43,000 reduction, which shaves the one and a quarter by 2.2%, uh, and that leaves you with the proposed operating budget of $20,635,850, which is a 1.04% increase over the previous year, and and would, by, of and by itself, represent a tax impact of a little over six cents against today's base. Somebody's got a question. Yeah, you know, I hate to keep up. You've got some children that don't speak English. How are you integrating? How about you handling it? How are you integrating? Oh, boy. Um, Sonny, we have two staff members who deal with youngsters that are learning the English language, and uh, they uh, spread themselves out between the three buildings. Um, and but all of the children are integrated into regular education classrooms, mm -hmm. um, and they're supported by their teacher, and then supported by our two. How many? How, how many kids? Are we there? have 34 youngsters that are currently receiving services, and they come from all over the world. Um, and uh, again, you, you're never sure who's coming. You never know who's going to walk through the doors. <laughs> but um, we are prepared to to, to help those students. Okay. So, that is the budget. I guess I would take your attention to revenues briefly before we wrap up operating. Excellent. So the revenues, what I provided, and there is a full length eight and a half by 11 uh, in the back of your packet. It will arrive for your viewing at page, uh, looks like 20, page 20. So it's just in from the back, uh, the revenues. Three, three big areas are driving changes in revenues as we anticipate them for the coming year. One is we've had some windfall, if you will, from the return of surplus from what was local government center is now health trust. Mm -hmm. In the current year, when we set taxes, that's about $160,000 of revenue. So just briefly, they send us, they have an operating year, they finish with surpluses, the new law or regulation uh, limits what they can hold on to for reserves. These are all the pools. Uh, anything in excess of what they can legally keep as a reserve, they have to return. And we've been calling it return of surplus. And so we get that return of surplus, and we then identify individual by individual how much they paid in, how much of that, or how much was paid in on their behalf or for their coverage and how much of that was district money contributed and how much it was individual dollars. We do this for all of our actives who are participating and our retirees. Of course, with our retirees, it's 100% their contribution. So we break down and we pay back to all of our actives and retired uh, employees their share, Sorry, and, the, and the remainder of the dollars is a general fund revenue going back to the district. So this year, in September, it was $160,000, roughly. There isn't a return of surplus this year. So as I anticipate revenues next year, 
and I haven't had a chance to communicate this fully to my staff or my retirees, but those that I've spoken to, here's the thing. We got what we asked for. They are anticipating rates more carefully, I guess, and their surpluses at the end of the year are within the reserve limits that they can keep, so there is no surplus to be returned. And so we're not getting any, and so we're not returning any to the staff, nor are we returning any to general fund revenue. So that's a, a, a major significant, uh, that's a major change in revenues, although that's only been a new revenue in the last three years. Yeah. So the second star here on my graphic is under building aid, and I talked briefly a moment ago about the $100,000 uh, that we lose in revenue from building aid because we simply aren't paying out the, the debt service. And the third is the fund balance. And candidly, we gave back $446,000 last year uh, or two years ago. Um, we gave back, uh, I got to look at those numbers. 446 was the actual. Oh, I, um, uh, the MS24 that I just did, uh, we're looking at uh, 400 and a quarter in uh, fund balance. But as I look to next year, it's hard to think we're going to keep at that. We've been shaving, and so I've anticipated 310 as a fund balance. So that's another 100,000 plus in, in, in shortened revenues. So, And you're projecting like a year and a half ahead. I mean, uh, it's, a long, it's a long ways out. So yeah. that's yeah. our presentation of Article 2, the operating budget $20,635,850. Okay. And we have all of the detailed yeah. documents in the back. Cool for everybody to, to go through. And do you, anyone have questions that they can think of at the moment on the operating budget? Because it's, you know, every tab, every oh, yeah. sheet, I mean, amazing detail mm -hmm. in here. Okay, Mr. Pierce? I have a question. This the same one I asked, I think, every year during the budget. There's a lot of access in the environment, like FTE. That doesn't mean a thing to me. Why don't you have a gloss on some of the acronyms uh, you use? Look frequently because I know you, in your environment, you all know what they mean, but I'm not in your environment. And uh, I just go by the everyday stuff. And FTE, for example, doesn't mean that. Full-time employee. Full-time mm -hmm. employee, in my case, because it could be, an FTE could be two half-time people. When I add them together, they're one yeah. full-time. That's one position. So an FTE is a, is a full position. I appreciate that, but wouldn't but, it be nice I'll to do, have a glossary? It would be great, and I could put that right under the info tab and put a glossary in there of all the acronyms. I'll do that. that would be great, because I've always asked this question <laughs> practically over here when I start going to the budget book. Because there's a lot of terms you folks use, which are fine, but they don't happen to click with me. If there's, I would say, listen, if, if, if anybody caught a couple of those, FTE is one, I'll go through and try to find everything that I can. But if there's anything else that jumps out at you, drop me a quick email and just say, add this to your glossary, because I think it's a great tool to have. Thank you. Sonny? Yeah. Uh, the New Hampshire Retirement Fund, they project 7.5% 7, 7, 7 return. They earn 1%. There's yeah. a big problem coming down the road. And, you know, at some point it's going to get down. You know, uh, uh, that's, that's just what I'm struggling with. You know, when, when my kids were small, we lived in Newton, Mass. I chaired the PTA council. The total budget for the city of Newton was thirty million dollars. You know what I mean? You know, you saw what happened with SAU twenty one, the school budget. Northampton, Hampton Falls rejected it. You know, the rest of the world is not on defined benefits retirement. You know. I'm struggling with, you know, how to handle the future. The, the impact of the retirement, Sonny, occurred over a long period of time. I understand. There was a time when the state contributed 35% to that retirement fund. Yeah. <laughs> About a few years later, they reduced it to 25%. Mm -hmm. And then they reduced it to 0%. Yeah. And they um, expected that the uh, responsibility of the, the pension fund for, for uh, educators fell on the backs of all of the cities and towns. And that's why you've continued to see your portion of retirement um, go up for not only for your teachers, but for your municipal employees. Right. And uh, we, we um, they work on it every year at uh, in, in Concord, but 
uh, they've not been able to do anything because if they change out the system and they and they start it with the new hires, the problem is the new hires feed into the system, which pays off your retirees. So do, do, do you see what happens? It, they've not been able to get out from under a defined benefit. Yeah, no, I, believe me, I, I understand. For example, I'm on Social Security at this point, you know, I'm fairly elderly. And actually my Social Security is going down because Part D took a big jump, you know, and a lot of Hampton residents are in the same boat, you know. I would have no problem with giving cost of living adjustments to employees, but, you know, public service is one of the few areas that that and senior executives are the only ones that are really riding on the curve. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you in all fairness to our teachers, there's a first year teacher starts out at $40,000. They all come to us with a four year degree and many of them here come with us with additional coursework. So when they come, they're taking lower salaries. I'm not saying that they didn't choose that profession because they did. And I understand that. But with that choice of being an educator came some benefit. And one of the, I mean, I started teaching, I, uh, I won't tell you the year, but I was making $6,300. Well, that yeah. that retirement benefit for me well, when I started. You couldn't be married in those days either, also. Say that again? You couldn't be married in those days, right? I beg your pardon. But again. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny. Not back then. <laughs> He says Laura Ingalls Wilder. I'm gonna <laughs> Wait, to get talk, us some good my women. friend. I was. <laughs> I admit, we uh, listen to the staff back there. They're loving this. Uh, A lot of smiles in the uh, back. But but it wasn't quite that far back, Sonny. I want to be clear with you on that. But the point that was, was 50, uh, try a little bit later than that too. Thank you. But the the. The point was that we had salaries, and there's other people in this room that started back many years ago, and one of the benefits to the teaching was a retirement. Mm -hmm. It was. I'll be very honest with you. Yeah. We didn't contribute much, and the towns didn't contribute much, and the fun grew. Yeah. Um, but uh, now it's, it, it doesn't happen that way, and now they want to take it away from them. If the accountants who are overseeing this and overseeing the retirement investments could understand what a real percentage of return is, it might cheer everybody up a little bit. Well, we'll see as the stock market, as you've seen in the last uh, month or so, the stock market has been booming, so obviously the um, the monies that the they put in. Today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah. But unfortunately, that retirement fund is everybody's, I was in Exeter about a month ago with legislators, and that was the number one topic. Yeah with area legislators and their concerns about the retirement both at the at, at the, in the school departments as well as uh, municipalities. Right. Uh, now, if we are pretty well set, you've all had your books for a couple of weeks, you've had a chance to go through. Are there any further questions or comments before I call because we will finalize this budget tonight. Uh, so we're going to vote yeah. for the... For oh, the absolutely. Budget. That's good with me. Um, <laughs> Regina? I just want to... I just want to make an announcement. Flat budget was at 1.04%. Great job. Great detail. The Warren articles, everything. You guys do a great job. I'm so glad that we have such a great school system in Hampton. And I just wanted to let the board know, the audience know, as a member of the board selectmen and as a representative to the board of selectmen on this committee, I will be abstaining on voting tonight. But I hope that everything makes it to the town to decide on, and uh, thank you for doing such a great job. I will remind you that the representatives from the <coughs> precinct uh, and the school and the selectmen, once they sit at this table, Ginny, right? You and I disagree on this They become a this member of Janet. this committee. And yes, I, I found that out personally. <laughs> 38 years ago, <laughs> you are entitled and supposed to participate with this committee like any other member, and you are supposed to vote your conscience because you are the one sitting here, the Board of Selectmen, the School Board for Ginny, and the precinct representatives cannot tell what their, their appointee what to do by voting. Uh, no one 
for us all, for the record, no one tells me what to do. And I, just, I will be abstaining what? from voting tonight. If you okay. can say yes, no, I'll abstain. I just, I would just wanted to do that. a little introduction before I just blurted yeah. out abstain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Henderson. You know, I'm going to echo what uh, Regina said as far as uh, tremendous. I mean, we all know that we have tremendous teachers in this town. We have tremendous staff. Uh, Mr. Lonely, just a fantastic job with this budget here. Everything's clear. It's uh, right to a point. There's uh, very few questions uh, reviewing it. From, I'm sure I can speak for myself, but I'm sure most of us, everything's laid out nicely. And uh, just a fantastic job, and uh, wish you well with the, uh, the budget and with the next school year. Thank it you. is Thank a joy. Very much. Barbara, who made the motion on the total budget? I did. Oh, uh, did. Danny did. I okay. wasn't done yet. What? I still had a couple more questions. Okay, in case go for jumping. it. Because I've got the engine turned on here. Yeah. Um, Mr. Henderson. Ass assemblies. Yep. Um, that seems to be growing exponentially. Is this for more security? What, what, assemblies? Where is Especially it? from yep. 14 to 15. Where, where are you? I'm coming. We went from, um, I'm on two, you're on page 1404, oh, right? Your student assemblies under extracurricular. Okay. Yep. So... <clears throat> This is another one of those categories. We talk about, in the past, we talked about field trips. Yeah. Assemblies are another one that, we, we budget 3,000 for each of the buildings, but they spend more than that over the course of the year, and they're supported by the PTA and other donations in their student activity funds that are managed mm -hmm. at the building level. Okay. So w the, the board and the district budget provide them 3,000, essentially, as seed money. Uh, you can see that in 1516, they did a pretty good job of, uh, of using it up. In 1415, we would have done, uh, I have to go back and look, I know the academy used their dollars, but mm -hmm. it must have gotten classified in the wrong account, and so you didn't see it here when we actually put the document together. Brian's actually finding that in 1415, the total is about six grand because academy yeah. is zero. But if you put academy back in there at 2,900 or 3,000 and they use it, yeah. you're back to 9,000 again. So they use it each year. Um, just that year, we must have charged the wrong account. Okay, um, that makes sense. David may have just paid for it out of pocket, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at this time, we should give a shout out to the PTA and also yes. the yes. box tops. Yep. Yes. Box tops, by saving the little box tops, we've made over four or five thousand mm dollars -hmm. that went to field trips and activities. So, thank you to the community for saving box tops. Thank you to the PTA that donates a tremendous amount of money to our libraries and our schools as well. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for supporting the PTA yeah. and the box tops. And tremendous support from parents, because I can tell you from yes. personal experience, the schools all have marvelous support from the uh, the parents of the student population. Um, we had an extra ten thousand dollars for bonuses. You did that last year, <laughs> and so it stayed in there this year. Yes. It's not okay because it showed as. It's not bonuses. Well, we call it. We, we were calling it yes. merit, merit payment. Merit pay there was bonuses. a decision made last year to call it bonus payments as opposed yeah. to merit payments. But um, that was an initiative that the board launched four years ago or five. Mm -hmm. uh, the notes are in there in the book. Uh, the, the, mo the initial motion that was made in the year was made, and then the changes that have been made subsequent to that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so yeah, a year ago the board made the decision to increase. It had been fifty thousand dollars when it right. was first conceived, and the initiative was first launched. That was reduced, but to thirty thousand uh, dollars uh, two years later. Mm -hmm. And this last year, went back up. It went to forty thousand dollars. That seems like quite an increase. It, it did a lot of staff in the school, Brian. This year, I it understand. Changed. It changed last but year. Right. Now, this isn't just the superintendent. This is done by committees. It's, no, this is done by the superintendent. Um, Just by the superintendent. Right, based on evaluations that are completed on all the staff that are eligible for the for the increase. Um, they have a um, performance review, an annual performance review, and based on that performance review are allotted a merit increase. And no merit increase is the same because they're all very different. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but you already had the... <clears throat> 30,000. Which was down from 50,000, which was the original. Right. And yeah. now we're going back up to, and that? added 10. It's in 2290. And it only it yep. goes yeah. to non union contracted. Right, non union employees. 
How many people fall into this category? 38. 38? Mm -hmm. So you're going to look at that. Yeah, a lot of staff here. It's a lot of staff here. <clears throat> right, but I'm seeing any time I think of bonuses and things it's like that. It's merit pay. <laughs> bonuses. Merit pay. Merit pay based on a, evaluations. It does not accrue to the base. Right. It's a it's a you know it's a one, one time, time payment. Yep. Right. It doesn't but, add but to it, their salary every year. Right. right. And I understand the question of the, but it does. It's not yeah. changing in this operating budget. It's that the numbers stay the same from right. sixteen seventeen to seventeen eighteen. <laughs> and my last one was um, wasn't DPW. And I know I'm asking a really silly question, but no. wasn't DPW going to help you with the moan? No. no, I mean like they, a couple of years ago. Not to my knowledge, years we ago. haven't gone that. No nope. I know I'd be yet. really stretching it. But they, um, obvious, it's a good time, good opportunity, as as Ginny said, to shout out and say thank you. They, yes. they certainly do plow, throw down the sand and the salt, and support us when the snow season comes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> trash and recyclables go away from the school. Yeah. We just seem to keep throwing it out there. Have you seen that little video about the guy who says to his wife? Something about the magic table. I leave stuff here, and in the morning, it always seems to be gone. I put my clothes in this basket, and they always seem to be clean. Yeah, yeah, I haven't yeah, figured I've out how that, that happens. It's the house yeah. of magic. Yeah. It's kind of like that. All that rubbish goes out there, all those recyclables, <laughs> and it just seems to go away every single day. And <laughs> yeah, oh, that's so great. We appreciate the work that yes. they do and how supportive they are. Yeah. And my only last little thing is the special <laughs> needs people that you have working for you are some of the most incredible <laughs> people I have ever seen or met. Um, I have contacts, but um, it's um, I just can't give out enough support for what they do because they really are a big line of I don't want to say defense, but yeah, um, yeah. they do a great job with the students, and so thank you. Good. Okay, Mrs. Bridal has moved, seconded by Steve. Mr. Henderson that we approve the 2017, July 1, 2017, through June 30, 2018, annual operating budget of the Hampton School District SAU 90. Would you, uh, Barbara, read the, the motion, uh, the amount of the motion again, please? Twenty million six hundred thirty-five thousand eight hundred fifty dollars. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Everybody comfortable? In favor? Unanimous. And Mrs. Ms. Barnes is abstaining. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. It's a joy to work with your budgets. Thank you. Um, 